before I get started, I did have one more announcement. Uh, Peter didn't forget. Pastor asked me to mention this this morning when more people would be here. So we have the church camping trip in the bulletin every year. And we got a different events going on. This year, I'm going to actually be doing an event. It's a men's, I got. I call it the men's stronghold body weight competition. So it's, it's for men. If you uh, are a man and identify as a man, you know, you're welcome to participate. I'd say 18 and above. And it's going to be, you know, like calisthenics, things like push-ups, pull-ups. If you're interested, you can start preparing. Now, that's why I'm announcing it now, three months in advance. If you want to start losing the weight so you can move yourself around better, you know, if you want to be a part of it, there, there are going to be cash prizes and just a competition. Who doesn't want to compete, right? And and so hopefully that'll be a lot of fun. If you want a list of the exercises and what they are, if you want to be working on them, I got a list of them. You can hit me up afterwards. But uh, let's get right into the sermon. Uh, thank you, Pastor Bersons, for having me here, of course, filling in. And we're looking at, or we're there in 2 Samuel chapter 15. I'm going to go ahead and reread the first six verses there. And it says in verse 1, And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, and that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And so it, it was that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So the title of this message today is Keep Your Family's Heart. Keep Your Family's Heart. And, you know, we see here Absalom, you know, Absalom is wicked here, you know, he's flattering these people, but what Absalom is doing to steal people's heart away from King David, that's, these, these things he's doing, we can learn from, and we can do these things not to flatter, you know, but to keep the hearts of those in our lives, our family, that rightfully should be ours. Okay? So we're gonna look at, you know, what Absalom meant for evil. We're gonna we're gonna mean it for good. And we're gonna see what we can learn from this situation. And primarily today I'm gonna be talking about your relationships with your children and your relationships with your spouses. If you and another uh, title I have for this is Instead of keep your family's heart, I have invest in key relationships. Okay? So this sermon is going to be a lot of practical tips and just how to, uh, to keep your, your, your children and your, your, uh, your spouse's heart. But, you know, you can apply this to other relationships. You say, well, I don't have a wife or I don't have a husband or I don't want to have kids or my kids are grown or I'm not married yet. Whatever. You can apply this to whatever relationships you do have or maybe will have. So be internalizing this for yourself. Think about how you could take the principles and the things that I might be mentioning and apply it to yourself. And don't apply it to, oh yeah, my husband or my wife or whoever else. That's what they need to do. No, I want you to be thinking about how can I do this and, and what can I do, right, to invest in these relationships, to keep this person, whoever it is, the children, the, the spouse, how can I keep their heart? Make sure I don't lose their heart or someone doesn't steal their heart away from me, okay? Like Absalom steals the heart of the children of Israel away from King David, okay? So starting out, we're gonna be talking about children first, and a lot of these things will carry over or apply both ways. We're gonna be focusing on the children relationship, parents and their children, keeping your children's heart is what we're talking about first. and. I like what I've heard. I've heard this before. I think successful child rearing has to have three things that kind of act as a tripod to have success. And that's number one, you know, spanking and punishing your children. You got to have that. Amen. The Bible teaches Amen. that. Number two, teaching and educating your children. They need to know what's right and wrong. They need to know the Bible. Those two things are important. But, the, but I'm going to be mainly focusing on the third leg of the tripod this morning which is having a loving and a close relationship 
with your children. You gotta have all three. If you if, if you have two but not one, whichever the one, it's probably not gonna succeed. You gotta have all three. And and I think you know, I think we have a pretty good mind about yeah, we gotta spank our kid. You know, thou shalt beat right. We we all believe that. We hear that. You know, and I agree with that. The Bible teaches that. Amen. And we all know, yeah, we need to teach our children. We need to teach them right and wrong. We're all for homeschooling here and teaching them the Bible and reading to your children every day. But I think sometimes it can easily be neglected and overlook the importance of investing in that personal relationship, the loving relationship, the positive relationship where you're having fun with each other, enjoying each other, these types of things, and you're actually investing in keeping their heart. I think sometimes that can get a little overlooked or a little undervalued. Uh, so, you know, this this may seem obvious. You know, it's like, well, yeah, we all know we're supposed to, you know, love our kids. You know, but we know that. But I know for a fact it can be over. It can be overlooked. Yeah. We, it can be neglected. Yeah, we know that. But then you end up just kind of not really knowing that, right? So. Maybe you feel like you already have a really loving relationship with the people that we're going to be talking about in your relationships, but you know what? Maybe you can improve it. Maybe you can think about that, right? And, you know, the goal of this sermon is to strengthen your relationships. Because, you know, if you don't have strong families, if you don't have strong families, then you're not going to have a strong church. You got, you know, the, the nuclear family is very important. A loving, close, knit relationships within family is very important. And everywhere else is attacking it. So we need something to strengthen it. We need something to affirm it. And um, so that's what we're going to be doing this morning. Okay. So go ahead and back up to verse 1. And we're going to look at a couple of key things that Absalom did to steal the hearts and what we can do to keep those hearts. Okay. <coughs> of our children. Look at verse 1, and it says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And keep in mind, you know, Absalom, he is intentionally seeking out to steal the hearts of the people. He's trying to flatter them because he's trying to overthrow the kingdom. If you know the story, you know, Absalom, you know, I'm not going to get into all that, but he's, but he's being wicked here. He's trying to undermine his father's authority, and he's trying to lead this, you know, this revolt, right? And, you know, we read about that if you were paying attention when uh, the chapter was read just now. So he's trying to steal the heart. So what does he do? He rises up early and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king, so they're, they're coming to King David, and he just is right there to intercept, right? And he's getting up early, making sure he's there. Then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of the one of the tribe of Israel. So I think what we can look at, uh, what we can learn from that is how Absalom is making himself available to the people he's trying to steal the hearts from. And you know, that's what we need to be doing. As Maybe. parents, you need to be available to your children. Right? And I'm not going to get too far into I'm going to look at the different things he's done. Uh, I'm going to look at the different things that Absalom did, and then I'm going to kind of talk about all of them at one time. It's not going to be a maybe as pretty of a point by point uh, type of a sermon here. So he's making himself available. Look at verse three. What else does he do? And Absalom said unto him, "See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man to of the king to hear thee." What is that? What's well, flattery? But what else is it? He's making it. He, he's making them feel cared about and important, right? He's not just available. He's making them feel like, yeah, what, what you're trying to do, what you're into, right? It's important. What you got going on in your life, that matters, right? That's something we need to be doing. Look at verse 5. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. You know, so he's showing physical affection. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's kissing. He's literally kissing him, right? So... Make yourself available for your children. Make sure they know it, right? Don't just say, yeah, I'm always there. But do they know that you're there, right? Make sure they know it. Spend time with them, right? Make, you know, talk to them, listen to them. You need to be making sure they feel like they're important to you by making yourself available, cutting some time out for them, talking to them, listen, actually listening to them, right? Uh-oh. 
don't just be correcting or the, the correcting parent. It's just, you know, you're always there to spank, right? And you're always there to, to teach them something, but you're not really just there for them, uh -huh. right? That, that's kind of what I'm talking about. And that's what Absalom was doing for them. He's not spanking them. He's not telling them. He, you know, he's making them feel loved, important. He's available for them. You know, he's just trying to point out David. I would say, yeah, you're, you know, David, he's not, he's not there for you. Too bad. You know, he was there for them. We need to be there for our children, listening to them. You know, we need to be to our children someone that they want to tell everything that's going on in their life. Mm -hmm. Because when we're talking about having their heart, we're talking about having their ear. They, they love us. They care about our opinion. It actually, it actually matters to them, right? You know, we could actually influence them, right? They're not just like listen to us, talk to them. They're just like, whatever, right? You could lose their heart, you know. Uh, well, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. <laughs> so, you know, that, you know, we're all busy, right? We're busy. You know, we maybe we don't feel like we have time to make these type of investments with our our relationships here. You know, I'm sure David was very busy too, right? right. Go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter four. But we need to make sure that we're not too busy and that we're not too you know, consumed with what we got going on in our work to be there and available for our, for our children in these relationships. You know, we ought not to allow our work life or even our service to God cause our relationships to our children to be just completely sacrificed and completely neglected. I mean, it could happen. Don't you think that that happens? I, th I think it happens. I, I think I've seen it happen. That's why I'm talking about it. Now, why are you talking about this? Because this is a thing. Neglecting these things, right? Because mm -hmm. you get too caught. You know, I love work. I think, I, and this is one of the reasons why I'm preaching is I think we are all about working hard at this church. We're all about the soul in it. We're all about the reading the Bible. We're going to read all these chapters every day. And we're going to do all these things. And these things are great. And we should be doing these things. But keep in mind, there's other things we need to do too that are also important. Don't lose sight of the things that are also important. Don't, lose, don't be like Martha, right? Who's, who's cumbered about, or you know, she's doing all these works and she's cleaning the house, she's getting the food ready, or whatever. But then she's, you know, missing out on hearing Jesus teach. Right? <coughs> Don't be like that. You know, it's important. It's not what she was doing; it was not important. But her priorities a little bit screwed up. You know? Don't miss the priority order in your life. Okay, you know what? The relationship with your children and investing in those is a high priority, or it should be. It is important. You know, maybe, maybe you ought to stop with some of the house chores you're doing. Women, wives, right? Moms, or, or dads, right? Whatever. Maybe, maybe you stop, you know, what you're doing every couple hours, and maybe you're like, hey, I'm just going to play with the kids. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to do something they want me to do. I'm going to make sure they're enjoying me once a day at least. Nice. Not just, ah, you know, spanking, you know, slapping heads and... All right, homeschooling, you know, you did this wrong, you need to write this down, work on it, homework. Like, and it's just, it's kind of all negative for them, right? Make sure it's like, hey, I'm not here to spank you. I'm not here to tell you you did something wrong. Let's get down on the floor. I'm going to tickle you. I'm going to, you know, we're going to play hide and seek. Depending on the age, you know, maybe not the teenagers, right? <laughs> you know, the age, you know, I got little kids, so I'm thinking about, it's easy for them. You know, you just blow on their stomach, right? Tickle them, hug them. Right? Make sure you're having something positive that you're doing with your children every day. Not just all work, business. We have an appointment, we'll meet for our homeschooling <laughs> session, and then after that is leave me alone, I'm cooking, I'm cleaning, cleaning your mess. No. How about figure out a way to get them involved in the work? How about enjoy them? How about they enjoy? Make sure they are enjoying you. Right? You might think, oh, I love my kids. You know, you're working away. You see them playing by themselves. You know, oh, I love my kids. But are they, you know, you're enjoying them by just watching them maybe. But are they enjoying you? Right. So maybe you should think about that. Maybe you should make sure you're not neglecting your kids in that way. That's right. Well, I'm spanking them, though. Well, maybe you're neglecting them in another way. Remember, I think it's a tripod that we need. 
successful child raising. You know, take an interest in their lives and what they like, right? For kids, it's probably something really simple. But, you know, just take an interest in it. Ask questions about what they're interested in, right? This is practical stuff, is it not? But this is what we need to be doing. You know, maybe you, know, you don't turn into the Hulk over every little annoyance. And I get it. You got a lot of things happening, happening, happening. It's just, you know, just kind of like, <laughs> Hulk smash some hit, you know, just go nuts. Maybe you don't need to do that. Maybe you need to chill out. Maybe you need to breathe. Maybe you need to spank. And then maybe you need to just let some of that stuff go. Because this is normal. When you got little kids especially, there's going to, you know, don't get all work, been out of shape over all the messes and them not, you know, trying hard enough in their school maybe. Hey, that's, that's going to happen, right? You know, you tell them to do something. You're, you're on a mission. You're telling, you know, do this, do this, and I'm going to do this. And then they don't do it right because they're learning. Chill out. Let them learn. Let them make the mistakes. Don't just, uh, you just, just let me do it. No. Why don't you teach them? Maybe you slow down. Invest in teaching them. Because if everything they're doing and they're, they're trying to obey is just this unpleasant thing, you think they're going to want to work? Maybe you try to make work a little bit more enjoyable. Not just, if I don't do it right, then just mom or dad, they just come down like a ton of bricks. You know, and you know, maybe you do that sometimes, but you know, because <laughs> it's just reality, right? But you know what? Maybe you need to try not to do that all the time. Right? Maybe you need to be a, a, a better trainer than that, right? You know, a work trainer. Because you're teaching, you're training them how to be a worker, right? When you're doing that. Allow them to make mistakes. Be patient, be kind. I had you turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 32, famous verse. Ephesians 4, 32. It says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Unless that's your children. If it's your children, just treat them like crap. Is that what it says? No. I mean, you need to be tender-hearted, forgiving, patient with your kids of all ages, especially little kids. You know, I'm kind of speaking, I'm going to be speaking a lot from my personal perspective of having little kids and being a father. And then later I'll be talking a lot about, you know, just the perspective from a husband. But, you know, you, again, apply this to yourself. Apply it to your kids, your relationships, your parents, your church members, you know, whoever that you're having relationships with or, or you know, find yourself in similar situations with. Uh, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 21, you're turning to Matthew chapter 5, Proverbs 21, 19 says, it is better to dwell in the, in, uh, in the wilderness, that's like the desert, right? Than with a contentious and an angry woman. And I would say, poor man. Just, just contentious, angry person in general. No one wants to be around that. Who wants to be around that? Raise your hand. You know, obviously nobody, right? I mean, so why don't you try to not be the contentious, angry parent? Because your kids are not going to want to be around you. You think you're going to have their heart? If they don't want to be around you, they'd rather just, all right, mom, all right, dad, see ya. She's crazy. He's crazy. Always mad. Dad's always mad. Every time I talk to him. Just mad about this. Always stressed. Always got something going on. And maybe what he got going on are, are good things. Things you should be doing. But maybe you ought not to be so stressed all the time. And just chill out. Maybe deload some of your plate if you need to. So that your children are actually having a positive experience with you every once in a while. I say they should be having it at least once a day. I mean, at least, right? Yeah. Not just negative, negative, negative. Right? All the time. That can wear them out. Yeah. Right? So Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Look at that. I had you turn to Matthew 5. Look at verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You know, you should be a source of peace for the children and the relationships in your life. Not just a stress, a, a source of stress, a source of, you know, pain and aggravation, pain in the book. You know, you know, again, apply this to yourself, you know, because this is a good apply to every relationship, you know, right? 
don't be a source of, you know, uh, just a pain in the butt or just a, a, a source of stress for, for people. Try to be a source of peace for them. Try to bring them joy, whatever that might do. Figure out what someone would like you to do and do it. Make them ha- make people happy. You know, we're here to serve others. Serve them in this way. You know, serve me especially not. <laughs> but seriously, you know, I like to joke every now and then, but you know what? So go ahead and turn to uh, Colossians chapter 3. Be a source of peace. Don't just be that negative source all the time. you got to have the negativity. you got to have the spanking. Do not take the sermon in the other direction. Yeah. you got to have the rebuke. That's you did this wrong, son. You, you're getting a whipping. But then, maybe when it's over, then you can be nice. Yeah. Then you can give them a hug. Okay. Then you can do, you know, do something, right? That's positive. Don't just be like, you messed up. See you later. See you tomorrow. Same time. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have both. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Gotta have both. Very good. You know, I believe that we should be trying to have our children enjoy us. I said this earlier, every day. And you know, maybe your career, as a man especially, right? Maybe women too, maybe your career or whatever you're doing, it takes up a lot of your time. Maybe it doesn't allow you to even see your kids every day. I would say you might want to really think about changing that if it's possible. Because I think it's really important that you're seeing your kids and interacting with your kids every day to keep their heart. You gotta be available, right? Like Absalom's getting up early, he's there. You gotta be there. If you're not there, how are you gonna really invest in that relationship? Well, I'm gonna call him. Well, maybe you could call him. Maybe that'll help. But I really, and this is my opinion, I think you need to be there. Look at, uh, I'm gonna read, uh, you're in Colossians 3, I'm gonna read Deuteronomy 6, 5. We know this passage. Homeschooling passage, right? Deuteronomy 6, 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So, well, that's, that's homeschooling. My wife's got that covered. Okay, well, then your wife's going to have your children's heart. But you won't. So when they're a teenager, they might care what mama thinks. But dad, he, he was never there. He don't know what I got going on. Who cares what he thinks? And then the boyfriend steals the heart. And then the girlfriend has their heart. I mean, you should have it. But you were too busy. And you know, I, we got to work. You got to provide. You got to do what you got to do. Sacrifice. But you know what? Know when you're crossing a line, too. Know when you're neglecting your kids' relationships. Because that's important. You know, there's a balance we need to find. And this is important to make a conscious effort to make sure you're doing it. And I think sometimes we get so caught up that we got to work, we got to provide, we got to get the overtime. You know, we got to do, you know, the, the, the women, they got to do the, the laundry, the cleaning, whatever. They're doing at home. And they're there all day. And they could still just not a single positive interaction all day you gotta be able to t- stop take back and it doesn't take that much time five minutes i mean that's so little but you could do so much in just a little bit of time just every day a little bit you know just ask them how their day was what'd you have for lunch did you have any dreams like what'd you dream about last night right what'd you do today did you have a good day i love you it doesn't take that much time does it giving them a hug Make it up. Tell them a joke. Tell them a dad joke. You know, I love dad jokes, right? <laughs> They're little, right? Make them laugh. Watch a funny video with them. Do something enjoyable with them. Just a little bit of time. It doesn't take much. That little bit of investment, though, can add up over a long period of time. And if you have a job and you just, I can't change my job. I have a job and this is how it is. Well, you need to make up that time later then. You know, I'm going to get to this later. I don't, I don't remember where exactly in my notes this is. If I get to it again, I'll, I'll get to it again. But you know, Solomon, or yeah, Solomon, he had a commission, a job, you know, a job where he had like a certain amount of men every month to, to work on, you know, the building of the temple and these different things. And they, he had them gone for a whole month out of, out of uh, three. So they would be gone a month, and then they would spend the next two months at home. Why not just have them all there all the time? Because the home life is important too. 
thinking. Even Solomon knew that. And I'm not saying what he did was exactly right, but you know, he did have some he had some wisdom. And I think we could probably learn from that. Have some common sense about that. You know, when they're born, you have their heart. But you can lose it. It could be stolen, like we saw with Absalom. They can, uh, you know, someone could steal your child's heart. If you're not there, if you're not really stepping up like you're supposed to be doing, like King David wasn't, for whatever reason. Maybe he was working real hard too, right? Or whatever. But he just kind of had a habit of neglecting relationships. And we're going to talk more about David and his other failed relationships later. He was a great man of God. But he had some failures. We don't want to be like David in the areas that he was a failure. He was a failure in the area of, you know, not neglecting his children. You know about the stories of his children, right? And Absalom was his son. The fact that he even wanted to do this says a lot. You know, he's obviously neglecting the nation of Israel to a degree. If if they're feeling like they can't really talk to the king because he's just, right? Maybe he should have worked on that. You know, obviously he can only do so much, but... We need to be doing what we can at least, right? Uh, had you turn? Well, okay, uh, I haven't gotten there yet. So I kind of mentioned this earlier. The Bible says in Proverbs twenty nine fifteen, it says, "The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame." Well, yeah, I do spank my my child. I spank them. I give them the rod and I give them the reproof. So they're not left to themselves. But maybe you're leaving them to themselves in other ways, though. Maybe you're neglecting them in other ways because they never enjoy you. You never enjoy them. You're just all work, no play, right? Mm-hmm. That's a kind of uh, leaving them to themselves. Mm-hmm. Leaving them with a need, an emotional need, that now they're going to find somewhere on TV, some celebrity. They're, now it's going to be their hero, right? Or they're, like I said, their friend. And they're, and they're really going to care about what their dumb, idiot, teenage friend thinks. Yeah. But they're not going to care about what you, that has hopefully a lot of wisdom, think. Mm-hmm. So maybe think about that. Make the right investments. Don't lose their heart. Keep your children's heart. Yeah. You know, and don't think, uh, don't think that you, you can't be their friend and be the one who disciplines and punishes. You can do both. Amen. I've heard that before. Well, I was the father. I can't, you know, be your friend. You can be both. You can do all things to Christ who strengthens you, actually, right? I mean, I think you don't have to choose. You need to do you need to do both. You need to do both. You need to correct, you need to reprove them, but you also need to be their friend. Someone they love. Someone that shows love for them. <coughs> Because then you know what? They're, if you do neglect that, then they're going to grow up. They're going to hate you, and they're going to resent you, and they're going to hate Christianity, and they're going to resent Christianity. Because you were always soul winning. You didn't miss a soul winning marathon, but you'd miss their birthday party, or you'd miss whatever, right? You'd miss something that they wanted, but you were really strong on serving God. And I'm not saying we should not do those things, right? Don't get me wrong. But if you neglect them. To do whatever else that is even a good thing, work, church related, service of God, they're going to resent you for it and they're going to resent whatever it was you were doing that took you away from them. And you don't want that. You don't want them to hate those things. You want them to love sowing it. Take them with you sowing it. You know, I believe in that, but don't cause these types of attitudes and this despite to arise in the hearts of your children because you're neglecting them. You're just, you're, you're skipping these little things that add up to be. Uh, very important. You know, I had you in Colossians 3, look at verse 21. Colossians 3, 21 says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Well, I'm not, you know, provoking anger. Well, you know, if you neglect your child and you're not really investing in those relationships, you're not really being their friend, you're not really giving them the attention and the time and your ear and your love and affection and all those things. You don't think maybe that neglect could lead to some anger yeah. in them? Don't provoke them to anger by neglecting them, lest they be discouraged. You know, think about our Heavenly Father. He's always there for us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us, right? 
we can always talk to him. Obviously, he's omnipresent, so he's got a slight advantage, right? <laughs> but still, he is the example, and we ought to make ourselves available. Our children, maybe they, maybe we're not always there with them, but maybe hopefully they feel that we're always there for them. That's yeah. really the important thing, right? You know, we can always talk to God. He's, he's the, he sends us a comforter. He's to comfort us. We ought to be comforting our children. We ought to be there for them. You know, he's a God that's near, not far off, as it says in Jeremiah 23, 23. A very pleasant help in time of need, Psalm 41, 6. Uh, turn to 2 Samuel 6. And he, I'm going to read for, uh, from you, uh, for you Hebrews 4, 15. You're turning to 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'm going to read Hebrews 4, 15. For we have not an high priest which can be touched with the feeling of our... Uh, I'm sorry. But we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. You know what? God, Jesus, He knows what it's like. He, our experiences, He knows what it's like. He's relatable. And you know what? You need to be relatable to your children. Don't just be this righteous standard that never is vulnerable, never does anything wrong. You need to you know, be real with them. Tell them what you've struggled with. Tell them your failures. They're going to respect you more for it, not less, actually. In fact, well, I can't show that side of myself to them because they need to respect me. They need to view me a certain way. Actually, I mean, if you're just trying to be righteous and you're being real with them, they're going to respect that way more. And now you're relatable. Now you're going to be able to have something in common. Now, if they got their struggles, you can tell them how it was like for you in a similar situation and how you understand. You know what it's like. You know how it feels. That's going to help. That's going to be a, an investment in that key relationship right there. That's how God is for us. He knows He knows our infirmities. He went through the same things. And when you read the Bible, Jesus is relatable. You read through the Gospels, you hear the things he went through. He had to, you know, I'm not going to get into all that, but he's relatable. Verse 16, the very next verse, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's not just relatable, he's approachable. We can come boldly to the throne of God with our prayers, our requests, our problems, our dumb little problems. He cares about it, though. He cares about it. We can come anytime we want boldly to God. And, you know, that's how we ought to be for our children, not just... Act like their problems are stupid, they don't matter, we got too much going on, we don't really care about that, right? And just, you know, kind of, maybe they messed up, maybe they did something wrong and they're coming to confess it to you, they know they've done wrong, and you're just like, ah, you know, they already know it's wrong. Maybe, you know, maybe be a little bit more approachable, not just so quick to anger when they come to you and they interrupt what you're doing or they tell you they broke something, right? Or they did something stupid. Maybe be a little bit understanding. Maybe be a little bit approachable so they feel like they can come to you with those things. Because if they don't feel like they can come to you with those things, they're not going to. And they're going to go to someone else. And you're not going to have that relationship like it should be. So maybe think about how you respond when people in your life come to you with bad news that maybe they're responsible for. All right? Just be slow to anger. All right? Think about that. That's good. So, moving on to marriage. So, hopefully everyone you know, that has kids, hopefully all your, your toes are hurting right now. I know mine are, right? I mean, this is something, this is not just, this is something for everybody. You know how I thought of this sermon? Because of life, right? You know, this is just stuff that I think would apply to me in a lot of areas and just, you know, things I try to think about and things I think a lot of us need to think about in all of our relationships. But now I'm going to be moving on to marriage and kind of applying these same things to marriage. We're going to look at another story. Uh, keeping in mind the same things with Absalom, but now we're going to look at another failure of David. Poor David, right? He's getting beat up this morning. Uh, you know, obviously to have a successful marriage and to really have a good uh, investment in that relationship, you got to be doing the obvious things. You know, Colossians 3.18. I, I think I had you turn. No, I had to turn to 2 Samuel. I'm going to read Colossians 3.18 and 19. We all know this. Hopefully, if you don't, well, now you're about to. Colossians 3.18, Wives, submit unto yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. And see, that word submit actually means to submit. 
It means to obey. It means to do what he says. If you didn't know that, you go back to Greek. Submit means submit. Okay. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives. Amen. And be not bitter against them. We all you gotta have this. This is like the foundational, fundamental thing. You gotta have it. But I'm gonna go a little bit further, get a little more detail, get a little more practical, hopefully, in the area specifically of investing with the, uh, in the relationship itself. And, uh, so look at First Samuel chapter six. I'm gonna read actually a free. So we're talking about the story of David and Michael. Okay, David's very first wife. He had multiple wives and concubines. His first wife was Michael, and David did not keep her heart. She started out loving him, but then she did not love him anymore. She actually hated him, and she despised him. And we're going to see that, see some of the failures, see what led up to it a little bit. In 1 Samuel 18, 20, it says, And Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. She loved him. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him, so they got married. You know, hopefully when you start your marriage, you have your spouse's heart. Because if you don't, I mean, I, I mean, hopefully you can earn it later or you can win it, you know. But usually I'd say most marriages, they start out and you love each other. Hopefully you're marrying for love. If you're not marrying for love, you need to marry for love. And if you're already married, you didn't marry for love, love each other anyways. Find the things that are good about them, like it, love it, okay? So... Hopefully, like children, you start out having their heart in marriage, but you know you could lose it. Lose your children's heart, but you know you can also lose your spouse's heart. And they can no longer love you, they could despise you. We're going to look at that, 2 Samuel verse six, uh, chapter 6 and verse 12. 2 Samuel 6, look at verse 12. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they that bare the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with the linen he bought. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord and she despised him in her heart. So it sounds like he lost her heart, does it not? And look at verse 17. And they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and dwelt and dealt, and he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well to the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today! who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of, the serv of his servants. And as, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. And David said unto Michal, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father, and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. And I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in mine own sight, and of the maid maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. So hopefully you know the story a little bit. This is a sad story. Right. I mean, it's a good story in the sense that they're bringing the ark into Israel, right? But it's a bad marriage story. It's not a positive example. Yeah. Um, why, why, what is her problem? What's her deal? You know, why, why is she not happy? I mean, we got this triumphant entry of the ark bring, you know, bringing into Israel. She's in this window. She sees it. She sees David, and she just hates him in her heart. What's her deal? What does she say? You know, she says, How glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants. As one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. So she's bringing up the handmaids, right? You're there, and you're uncovering yourself. You're dancing, and you're acting the fool in front of the handmaids. Well, you know, if you know the story about David... Michael was the first wife, 
And then he marries two other women. And he was gone for a long period of time. Now, he's being persecuted by Saul, but she wasn't there as far as we know. She gets married to someone else, actually. Right? She's kind of neglected, right? It sounds like they're not really investing a whole lot in that marriage at all. And he's moving on to other women, and now she's bringing up the handmaids. Sounds like she's probably jealous. Sounds like she's probably neglected. I mean, it sounds understandable to me. And I'm not saying what Michael did was perfect and was right, but you kind of have to feel for it a little bit, don't you? Yeah. I do. I mean, I can understand that. And, of course, David, he responds wrongfully because he's being, you know, disrespected, and that's what men want. They want to be reverent, but she's being irreverent. So it's just a bad snowball effect in the wrong direction. And what does it lead to? No children ever again for Michael. That sounds like a great marriage. Who wants to be like David in this area? Not me. She wasn't made to feel important. He wasn't showing up early for her. He wasn't making what she had going on in her life feel important, right? He wasn't showing her the physical touch. I mean, he's so busy. I mean, he's all busy about the things of God. I'm not saying that's bad, but he shouldn't have been doing that. But, you know, maybe she could have been there with him. Maybe she could have been among the handmaidens. Not just off in some balcony somewhere, nothing to do with it, away, not included. I'll get to you and when I get to you. Now she despises the things of God, I think, too. That's not what you want to do as a husband. You don't want to neglect this relationship. Your marriage is probably your marriage is the most important human relationship you'll ever have. Yeah. Don't neglect it. Yeah. Right. Okay? <clears throat> you know... We need to do the same types of things for the children where I see a lot of the same things I'm applied to the marriage now. We need to be listening to our wife or our husband. Listen to them. Enjoy them. Make sure they're enjoying you. Right? Be a source of pleasure for them. Be a source of peace for them. Not just all work, no play. We got this, 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 this. That's it. See you tomorrow. Business. It's not a business relationship. It's a marriage. You know there's a difference. You know, you ought to love your spouse. You ought to be loving to your spouse in these ways. Every day. Multiple times a day. Make yourself available in that way. It's important. Unless you want to be a failure and a loser and have a loser marriage. And you know, I don't have multiple wives. We're not a we're not having we're not supposed to have multiple wives and other spouses and concubines. So if one marriage you know doesn't work out, well that's okay, I'll just move on to the handmaids. That's not an option. So maybe we need to invest in these relationships. Maybe you need to work on your marriage every day. Work on it before it needs work. Because it does need work before you think it does. You need to be working on it every day. Uh, turn to Proverbs 18. You know, you ought to be enjoyable to your spouse. Don't just be a constant test of their character to stay married to you in your, in your marriage. Like, oh man, he's a real delight, but I gotta stay married to him, I gotta be faithful, I gotta submit, even though, no. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe you try not to be that for your spouse. Maybe you make it easy to be married to you, right? What kind of a spouse are you? Maybe you can try to make it easy to be married to you. How do you do that? Care about them. Do things for them. Serve them. Think about think about what they want. Figure out what they want and give it to them. Listen to them. What do you want? What do you like? What do you feel like is not happening that you want to happen? Make it happen. Give it to them. I don't feel like I see you enough. See them more. I don't feel like I spend enough time with you. Spend more time with them. Or, or your marriage is going to suffer. But I gotta work. I gotta go soul in it. Do both. Maybe cut back a little bit on the one and do both. You need balance. You need both. You may, maybe you need to go on some dates with your spouse. We're already married. We don't need to date. Yeah, you do. You need to date. Maybe you can get you a trustworthy babysitter. I mean, you know, I don't believe you should just give your kids off to just anybody. I don't give my kids off to anybody Amen. except for my parents and my wife's parents. That's it. Wow. You know, 
but you know, I can get them to babysit sometimes. We can, we can, take, we can go on a date. If you've got older kids, you got to do them better. you gotta be, you got a babysitter right there, right? Get you a babysitter. Maybe start going on some dates so you can talk, you can listen, you can laugh with them. Laugh with your spouse. When's the last time you and your spouse laughed together? Just the two of you. Not at church with other people there. Just the two of you. Huh? Maybe you ought to work on laughing. Maybe you should tell your wife a joke. Tell her a dad joke. See if she likes it. <laughs> wow, I love some. Not really. She likes some of them. Be, why don't you be silly with each other? Maybe you could flirt with each other. You know, I mean, I know this is real profound. Maybe you could relieve some of their workload. I bet they'd love that. You're so busy. I bet they're busy too. Maybe you think about how you can deload some of their work, make their life easier. Won't you just be so sweet to them like that? I bet that. See, we're talking about earning some brownie points Amen. with all these relationships. We're talking about earning, brown, getting some brownie points. Okay. Why don't you do something thoughtful for them? Why don't you, you know, let them go for a run or go for a walk? My life, my wife, she likes to go for runs. Right. So who do you think's the babysitter letting that happen? Wonderful me. No, I'm just kidding. But you need to let your wife do the things she feels like she needs to do, she wants to do. Let her do it. Yeah, I mean, I know you're the one who's in charge. You're the man of the house. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with every now and then you taking the kids and letting her go get her nails done or letting her go run a couple of miles or whatever. Maybe you should do that. But whatever your wife or your husband wants, if there's no reason not to give it to them, give it to them. It's going to make your marriage better. You think Who thinks this is going to make your marriage worse? This is kind of just common sense, isn't it? Well, how are, why are we not doing this? Because it, it's easy to neglect. That's why. It's easy to just let these things slip. We don't think it's as important as what it really is. You know what? You can lose your wife's heart and be miserable and be a failure. I don't want that. I don't want that for my marriage. I don't want that for your marriages either, y'all's marriages. Why am I preaching this? Because I care about the families and the, and the marriages and the children, parent relationships, the, re the relationships in this church. I care about them. I want it to be strong. I want them to be good. I want them to be solid so we can have a solid church so we can actually do more things for God. Yeah. Right? You know, why don't you write a poem for your wife? Write her a love poem. Wow. Roses are red. Right? <laughs> do something. Something like that. Get her some flowers. Give them, a, give them a massage. Now, I'm talking about more from the perspective of the husband, but wives, maybe don't get your husband flowers. <laughs> maybe get him something, do, you know, or just do something. Give him the massage. He'll probably like that. You know? Talk to them. Hey, be nice to them. Be nice to your spouse. Be nice to your husband. Don't you, oh, I gotta obey. Yeah, but besides just obeying and, and, and why don't you be nice? That goes a long way. Oh, you know, yeah. did I have you turn to Proverbs 18? Yeah. yeah. Or we're there now. Go ahead and look at Proverbs 18. Look at verse 20. You know, you had to be nice to get a wife. Let's, let's look at that. So Proverbs 18, verse 20. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. That's the things you say. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. You know what that's teaching? Be nice with your mouth. Look at verse 21. Death and life and the power of the tongue, things you say, and they that love it shall the fruit thereof. You know what that's teaching you? Be nice with your mouth. Right? Think about what you're saying, how it's going to affect you and others. Verse 22. Whoso findeth the wife, findeth the good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Verse 23. The poor useth entreaties. I mean, they're nice with their mouth. They're humble with what they say. But the rich answer abruptly. What's that teaching? Be nice with your mouth. Essentially. You know... Verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Got to be nice to others to have friends. I don't have any friends. Well, maybe you're not nice enough. Yeah. Maybe you're fake. Maybe you're you know, doing something wrong. Okay? You got to be friendly and nice to have friends. You got to be nice with your mouth. And there is a friend that sticketh close to the brother. So 20, be nice with your mouth. 21, be nice with your mouth. Verse 22, uh, 22 hey, if you, have, if you found a wife, you found a good thing. 23, be nice with your mouth. 24, be nice with your mouth. I think maybe you have to be nice with your mouth to get a wife. Yeah. Obviously, you got to be nice. you got to sweet talk. you got to be someone that she likes. And you know, why stop when you're already married? Oh, we're married? Done with that. You ain't got to be nice to her no more. 
why don't you still tell her the sweet little nothings and little cute messages or whatever you were doing when you were dating? Why don't you keep that going? And don't be you know, falsely advertising the relationship. <laughs> You're doing, oh, I love you too. Oh, I miss you. Kisses, exes, whatever. And then, oh, Mary? Oh. Hadn't talked to him in a week. <laughs> he comes home, he goes to bed. He's on his phone. Huh? On his phone, not talking to me. Not asking me how my day went. Kiss my butt or nothing. He just don't talk to me. He ain't nice to me. And when he does talk, just I'm busy. Right? Or she's busy. She's too busy to be nice to you. Wives, are you too busy to be nice to your husband? You too nice to praise each other? You too busy to praise each other? To compliment each other about something every now and then? Man, you look good today. You just looking good all the time, actually. I just don't ever say it enough, right? Wow. You know, oh man, you do it, man, you did a good job. The house looks great. Man, you look strong. I mean, you've been working out. You know, this is the wife saying, you know, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. You know, you got big biceps, woman. Right? I'm <laughs> following my train of thought here. Why don't you be nice with your mouth to your spouse? I bet you that might even help your marriage. It might make it a little bit better. Give the compliments. Get the feedback. I was saying, I was talking about this earlier, you know, ask them, like, is there anything, I, I do this, you know, this, every now and then, I'm like, hey, is there something about what I'm doing? Because I'm the leader, I'm the one who's making the decisions, but you know what, I'm like, every now and then, hey, is there anything that you don't like about what I'm doing? You know, my, my work does stuff like that. They're the boss, they're in charge, but you know, they'll do these employee surveys, right? Maybe you could do like a wife survey to see, what she likes. Well, now that you ask, this is what I got. This is what I think is suffering. This is what I feel like I, I really need and really would like and never get. You need to do. You need to do that. You need to listen to that. Not just think, oh, that's not really. That doesn't really matter. Or I can't do that. Well, maybe you think you can, but you know where there's a will or the way. Maybe you just need to figure out a way to to make it happen and still do what you need to do. Listen. Get that feedback. You know, do, do do the surveys right. Maybe write it out, you know, just add, just talk to them, right? Constantly be trying to work on and improve your marriage. You know, the Bible teaches we ought to dwell with our wives according to knowledge. You need to know what she wants. You need to know what she wants even if she doesn't know what she wants. You need to dwell with your wife according to knowledge. You know, wives too. You need to know what your husband wants. Give it to him. He wants to be respected. He wants to be loved, you know. And individually, figure out what they individually like and want, specifically. You know, to figure out the love languages, right? Give to them what they like. Have that love language conversation of what, what they like, how they like to receive love. Figure out what they like, you know, to receive love as, in the, whatever the format, giving gifts, praises, physical touch, you know, whatever. Figure out what their or, order list is and then do those things. Do it. Write it down so you don't forget so you're not asking every day, right? Uh, did I have you turn to Proverbs 5? Well, you're in Proverbs already, so uh, you can bounce around with me. Go to Proverbs 5. I'm going to read in Proverbs 27. You know, we need to be giving our, our spouse affection. Remember, we're talking about Absalom. He's kissing them. Well, you might think that's kind of weird, but no, it's definitely not weird in marriage. It shouldn't be weird in marriage. Like, what do you mean kissing? I thought that's just, you know, kiss, hug, affection. You know, we kind of talked about a lot of this. You need to be doing these things in marriage, things they enjoy. Proverbs 27, verse 7 says, The full soul, not the foolish person, but the full person, the one you're full of it, right? The full soul, the person who's full, loatheth or hates and honeycomb. But to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. So someone who's full and you've eaten a lot, you don't really want to eat anything, right? You go to a buffet, you don't want the dessert usually. Or you don't, you know, the thought of eating something, you're like, oh, I just can't imagine think eating anymore. One more bite. Just can't think of it. But when you're hungry, you know, eventually maggots start looking good. Or, or whatever, you know, I don't really like onions all that much. You know, onions, I mean, I just want to bite an onion. If you get hungry enough, everything looks good. Oh, it would be so nice to have the thing that I usually hate. Yeah. Well, other appetites, it's just as true. And, you know, there's only there's certain things in marriage that only you as the spouse are supposed to be gratifying. And if you leave that ungratified and you're not fulfilling that need in their in their in their life, they're going to be hungry. 
You don't want that. Because now you're opening yourself up to being susceptible to dangerous things, adulterous things. Right? You don't show them any attention, and then someone else comes along and they steal the heart. Right? Keep your wife's heart. Keep your husband's heart. Keep your spouse's heart. Don't let these things that only you can do for them, you're the only one who should do it for them at least, don't let those things be neglected. Do them. Do them really, really well. Right? Don't do the minimal. You know, do like the psalm says, my cup runneth over. That's how your spouse should feel about you. Man, my cup runneth over. My husband, my, my wife, they just take care. Everything I want and then some. They go above and beyond. Why not? It's going to take work, but you know what? probably saving yourself from someone stealing their heart. You're probably saving yourself from adultery. You know, your relationships, I like this analogy, your relationships is like a, a fuel tank in, in your car. You know, you want those brownie points, those positive interactions, those good, enjoyable things. That's like the gas going in your tank. You want that gas tank to be as full as you can. Keep it on full. Because then, life's going to happen. Bad things are going to happen. You're going to have a day when you're having an off day. It short fuses. You say things you shouldn't. You haven't seen them in a while because you got something like that you just can't do anything about. You're on that month, you know, thing like Solomon's workers. And, you know, you want that gas tank to be full so that it can handle some stress. So it can handle, you know, a five-hour trip, right? Because if you're already on fumes and you're on empty and you're at a quarter of a tank, well, maybe that marriage is not going to get so far. So be constantly trying to fill up that gas tank in your relationship, in your marriage. Be, be putting those brownie points, that gas, in that gas tank. Hopefully that makes sense. You know, you have a stressful day. You got you got bad circumstances. Somebody gets cancer. Well, if you got to fill a, a full tank, then that's probably going to help the situation. Don't you think? You be working on that. So you can handle the stresses that life might throw at you. Amen. Look at Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. A strange woman is the whorish, adulterous woman, not your wife. She's smooth, but she's her end is bitter. She's going to lead to your death and, destroy, uh, and, and destruction. I mean, uh, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold in hell. Verse 5. Look at verse 14. Skip down. It says, because he was you know, mixed up with this wrong woman, he says, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. How are we going to solve the problem of the strange woman? Well, you're going to be married and you're going to be satisfied with your spouse, your wife. Look at verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. What does waters have to do with your wife? Stay with me. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad in rivers of waters in the streets. Be satisfied with your water. Let it be yours. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad. You, get, you know, you, you got uh, you know, a bountiful supply of your waters at hand, ready and available. Anytime you want to drink, you got to drink. It's yours, right? This is picturing your wife. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Let thy fountains, your relationship with your spouse, let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Because that's what we're talking about. Keep them satisfied. Be satisfied with your spouse. Look at verse 19. Let her be as a loving hind and pleasant road. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. At all times. And be thou ravished always, always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Why would you seek something, someone that's not your spouse when you're so satisfied and happy and content in your marriage? Amen. Well, you would maybe if you're not happy, you're not content, and you are neglected in your marriage. So satisfy. Do not neglect. Keep those, the, the, the brownie points, keep those positive interactions high every day if you can, right? I believe, just like with the children, we should be trying to have these positive interactions every day with our spouse. Because if, and I'm not going to get to it, uh, read, read this, you can turn to, turn to Deuteronomy 24, and I'm just going to refer to this in passing for sake of time. Um, 
First Corinthians chapter seven teaches that you know you're getting married to fulfill a certain desire in marriage, right? And that you ought not to defraud the other person in the marriage. And the only time that you would abstain from this relationship is with consent for a time of fasting. How often or how long would you say most people are fasting? Maybe you fast for a day, maybe you fast for a couple of days, but how often are you going to fast for a couple of days? So if you if, if like this is the only thing that would stop that relationship normally, but you're not even there every day anyways because you're you're gone all the time. Well, how does that really job with this then? That you know what I'm saying? If you're just not even there most of the time, then well, it's fasting and it's this then, right? Whatever that's keeping you gone all the time. Good point. And you know, we talked about with Solomon's men. They're gone for one month. That's a long time. That's something besides prayer and fasting. But you know what? Then they're there two months. So if you're going to be gone, you can't do the daily thing, uh, the daily investment, then you need to make up for the time lost and do uh, like over, like, you know, stock for the next time and make up for what you missed. Because if you don't, then you're going to be running on E and that gas tank, that marital gas tank we talked about. So again, you know, with the career and the thing, whatever it is, you know, you say, well, I need the money. I, I gotta, I gotta do all this. You know, I gotta have this job. Well, you know, maybe you don't need the money as much as you think because the Bible says in Proverbs 15, 17, better is a dinner of herbs, uh, a meal that's not as enjoyable uh, is what the idea is. Where love is, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox with a more preferred meal and hatred therewith. It's Amen. better to maybe have a little bit less money and have love in your marriage, in your family, in your life than to have the extra money, the extra income, the nicer version of whatever, but now you got the hatred. Yeah. And now when your wife sees you, she despises you. When you finally get home, she just hates you. She sees you coming up the driveway, finally, and she looks out the window like Michael, and she despises you in her heart. But I got all the money. That's not what, that's not what it's all about. So... You think about that for yourself. And again, we all have to work. We have to provide. But again, there is a line that you can cross. Amen. And when you're starting to neglect things, you should not neglect. Um, Deuteronomy 24, look at verse 5. We're going to have to turn. Deuteronomy 24, 5 stresses the importance of time together and working on marriage. Time together within marriage and just the importance of working on your marriage. When uh, a man had taken a new wife, so this is when you're first married, which is not necessarily just when you've been married for years. He shall not go out to war. Neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, which she have taken. And, you know, it's not that she's sad and depressed. It's just that you need to be working on this relationship. When you first get married, you need to be there for the first year. You don't need to be going off to war. You don't need to be doing any other business. You need to be there. Investing in this key relationship, your marriage, cheering up your wife. This is this is talking about making her happy. This is talking about doing all the things I've been talking about, listening to her, whatever she likes. Cheering is is her being happy. Cheer your wife. When's the last time you cheered up your wife? Your sad, sad wife. No, I'm just kidding. So, you know, make your wife happy. You know, invest in that relationship. Because again, you know, this is something that's even a priority after you're married. Because, again, we saw the, the one-month, two-month ratio being taken away. And you might think, turn to Luke chapter 14, you might think of this scripture maybe had just something I thought of as just, uh, how to reconcile these different ideas. Because I'm stressing the importance of investing in your marriage, your children, your, in your families, relationships. But look at verse, uh, Luke 14 and verse 26. Luke 14, verse 26, some people might say, well, what about Luke 14, verse 6, where it says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mo and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And you might think, well, I want to be a disciple of Jesus, so my marriage is just, screw it. I hate my wife now. <laughs> yeah. When he's talking about hating, obviously he's not talking about feeling hatred for your spouse. He's talking about the, the, the sacrifices that will come and the stresses that will come on those relationships uh, 
or there could have been wedgie between uh, those relationships in Christ, especially if they're like an unsafe spouse or they don't consent to the things of God. But even if you and your wife are on the same page with the things of God, it can still take a toll. So is this teaching to just go ahead and neglect your wife uh, or neglect your children? And neglect yourself. Just don't take a bath. Don't brush your teeth because you got to be disciple and you just got to skip that so you can do more soul. Okay, well, I don't think so. Let's keep going. Let's skip down and look at verse uh, 33 where he kind of wraps up this teaching. He says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So is he saying forsake your wife? Just divorce her, I guess, now. Just forsake her. Just forsake her, forsake your children, and just hopefully they'll turn out okay. No. Obviously, he's using extreme language, but he's not just saying just have a bad marriage, neglect your wife, because there's a whole other rest of the Bible that stresses the importance of cheering up your wife in the first year. So I guess you can't be a disciple of Christ if you just got married. No, that's not what it's teaching. There's a balance is what it's teaching, right? So serving God will take away from your marriage, you know, some, right? And will add stresses. You know, think about, you know, Pastor Burton, he lost his job. Think that maybe stress their marriage a little bit, or just all the work he's doing here. I think that might you know put a strain on the marriage, or you know there are strains and stresses, and in a sense, it's like you hate that relationship. But it's about having the priority of Christ being higher. But right after Christ in your life and serving Him is your wife, and you can do both. And you know, the Bible teaches that we ought not to be righteous over much. It says in uh, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 7. I referred to 1 Corinthians 7 earlier, and I'm going to look at something else in that chapter about when you're married. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7, 16, it says, Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? But this is not saying, just go ahead and sin a little bit. This is saying, you can get too carried away doing a good thing. You can do too much righteous thing, like Let's, for example, if you're going on, like you're going soul winning every single day and you're working a full-time job and you never see your wife, you never see your kid, you never, you're not really taking care of your own health either, and you're just kind of destroying yourself, you're just burning the, 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 the candle at both ends just for, for your whole life. And I understand you have to do that sometimes. I get it. That's part of the life, you know. But don't do it all the time because then you're going to destroy yourself because you're trying to do too much of a good thing. So it's, I'm not saying it's a backslide. It's different than backsliding. This is talking about doing things you know, at a pace that you can do the rest of your life and not destroy yourself. You know, the Christian life is a race. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Like, okay, you know, just as fast as I can until the, wheel, the wheels fall off. It's a pace, and when you're running long distances, you got to settle into a pace you can stay at. Amen. And maybe you start a little faster, and then you kind of, you know, I kind of need to, I need to back off a little bit. Maybe other people are going faster than you, but you might need to. I, I'm not really able to go that fast, but I am able to go faster than this guy, this loser. No. So you find your pace in the Christian life. What's too much of a strain, too much of a stress on your children's relationship and your marital relationship, right? Obviously, you don't neglect the things of God, but this is how I would reconcile these two ideas. So I think that you kind of can get carried away with thinking, well, I want to serve God. I want to do the best I can. That's a great desire. But you don't want to do it to the point that now you're losing the heart of your wife and your, kid and your children. Because you know what? If you're a bad father, you're a bad Christian. Because God told you to be a good father. And, you know, if you're a bad spouse, then you're a bad Christian. Because God told you to love your spouse, love your wife, your man. Well, I don't have time to love my wife because i got to be a disciple all the time. you got to do both. you got to realize what the, the teaching is. In 1 Corinthians 7, look at verse 32. But I would have you without carefulness that he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord. How he may please the Lord. Yeah, if you're unmarried, you can just spend your whole life, all your free time, thinking about how you're going to serve God and pleasing God. <clears throat> Look at verse 33. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please 
his wife. Because all wives are worldly. No, I'm just kidding. So if you're married, it's not all about serving Christ, is it? According to the Bible here, because now you need to be caring for your wife. So you can't just devote all of your attention on just 100% of the time serving God. That's why even Paul was saying it would probably be a good idea for her to stay unmarried. Amen. But you know, that's not going to be everybody. And it can't be everybody. Otherwise, the human race would cease to exist. Because you got to have marriage. you got to have children, right? So, just kind of skimming through here. Seeing what I want to mention in closing. Thankfully, we are all on the last page of the notes here, so that's good. So, you know, don't have the attitude that just use people in your life as a box that needs to be checked, and that's it. Like, you're a man, and you're like, I want to be a pastor someday, so I'm going to get a wife. Check. I'm going to have kids. Check. And I'm going to rule them with a rod of iron. They're going to have all gravity in my house. Check. Yeah, that's good. But don't just only do that and, and not have this relationship and the caring aspect. It needs to be there because you know that there you can rule your house and get your wife to do well you can get your wife to do certain things but go along with certain things and just really hates you in her heart you can get your kids to make your kids do all kinds of things and they're just waiting until they turn 18 and they're gonna get the hell out of there and get away from you and they're not even saved so good job ruling your house right if that's what happens because you don't want to just rule you want to lead lead the house, you know, that, that requires you having their heart. Does it not? You've got to have the heart. You know, and again, apply this to church family. Apply this to your, your other family, your mom, your dad, your, your siblings, extended family. Keep their hearts. You know, our life is about God and people. Those are the two great commandments. I'll read this to you in closing. Matthew 22, 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law, Jesus said unto, them, unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. That's priority number one. And then he felt the need to add this. And the second is like unto thee. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And you know who's more important than your neighbor? Your children. You know who's more important than your children and your neighbor? Your spouse. And of course, you know who's more important than that? Right after that, then God. Don't sacrifice one over the other. Keep it in the right order. Do it all. You know, ask yourself, you know, what would my marriage, what would my relationship with my children be like if I started doing some of these things? How would it improve? What would it be like? So in conclusion, you know, invest in your relationships. You know, invest in your children. Invest in your spouse. Show that you're available. Show them that they matter to you, that they're important. And, you know, give them the attention and the affection that they need and want from you. And, you know, keep, keep their love. Don't, let, don't lose their love. That's what we're talking about. You know, keep your family's heart. Keep their heart. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the wisdom we can take from it to learn how we can have happy and fulfilling uh, lives and relationships with our key relationships in our life. I pray that you would help us to have strong families in this church and that this sermon would, uh, was a blessing to the families here and the marriages here. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.